Father. Father, I pray. Watch over us as we dive into your word, Father. I pray that you answer for me as it's clearly written. I pray that you speak through me and may it not be my words uh, that are spoken, Father, but that may it be the words that are spoken. So, Father, Study your word together as we talk. Well, a lot has transpired in my life since the last time I sat for a front room meeting at the pulpit. I left for General Conference down in South Carolina last week. Wednesday, I have thought that would be my last trip for quite some time. Summer is always a very busy season of our lives, going to uh, these different camps and conferences. And conference was going well, and then on Friday afternoon, received word that my grandpa was not doing well. He was only given a few hours to do a couple of days to live. So I left right away. I was out packing my bags for a trip to my family later in the day uh, to Michigan. We drove to Ohio, uh, getting in a bit after midnight that night. Slept for uh, a couple of hours, and my family left from Ohio to Michigan. And we got to spend the next few days with Grandpa and the rest of our family on my dad's side and Justin starting off the journey, but going a bit maybe a bit more drunk or moaned. Uh, but that was about the extent of that. And we held out longer than the doctors were anticipating. And uh, this held true uh, throughout his life. He had a series of life altering strokes eight years ago, had a major artery that was over 99% blocked uh, a year ago. Fell and broke his hip a year ago. He constantly hung around longer than the doctors thought. So he finally fell asleep in the wee hours of the morning on Tuesday. And uh, my grandma spent the day over there and was there with him and saw him for the first time today. So then we had a quick turnaround as he passed away Tuesday morning and then had Greg's funeral on Thursday. So it was the first time that I conducted a funeral for a family member of ours. And I know uh, God is patient and, uh, yeah, I'll do that. Pardon me being absent-minded today. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, we, uh... So we had uh, Grandpa's funeral, uh, first time, uh, did a uh, service for a family member of ours. And God is patient in bringing back his son. Uh, selfishly, I would love for Jesus to come back before we have to uh, bury another family member. And I know many of you are in the same boat this morning as well. You'd love for Jesus to come back and defeat sin and death once and for all before you have to bury another family member of yours as well. And the fact of the matter is that we don't know when that day will come. However, Jesus provides for us a number of clues and signs of what to be on the lookout, lookout for in anticipation of his return. And that's been our focus uh, through this series that we've been going through uh, for a little over a month now on the signs of the end. As it seems more and more Christians are becoming interested in what to expect come the end. What, sh what sort of signs of the end of this present evil age should we be anticipating? Should we be on the lookout? out for. So through the series, we're attempting to answering that question by exploring uh, what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter 24. If you have your Bible, you can open up to Matthew chapter 24, as this is Jesus' longest teaching on the signs of the end. The disciples asked Jesus when these things will be in reference to the temple being destroyed and what will be the sign of his coming and the sign of the end of the age. And at this point throughout our series, we've covered all of the signs that Jesus provides in response to these questions. Uh, that, that summary slide there, Jesus says uh, in response to these two questions, he says that there are going to be a number of general signs. We count up 12 general signs. These include wars and rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes in various places, and the gospel message of the kingdom will be proclaimed to all nations. And then we see starting in 15, uh, Jesus gives uh, a more specific signs of what to expect. Jesus says that there's going to be an abomination of desolation. Uh, it seems to be the beginning of the end playing out. It seems to be talking about something that is disgusting or filled with hate that causes emptiness or destruction. And so Jesus gives us a more clues about this abomination of desolation as well. And he says it's the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. 
And then Jesus says, after the abomination of desolation, there will be a great tribulation. And this tribulation will be unlike anything that the world has ever seen or will see in the future. And then he says, immediately after the tribulation, there will be a number of heavenly signs. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens. And this all culminates with the Son of Man, Jesus himself, descending on the clouds with power and great glory. And when he descends from heaven to earth, there will be a great trumpet call, and all of the elect, the chosen ones of God, the ones who remain faithful to God in Christ Jesus, will be gathered together. And it's at that point that God will grant his children eternal life. This is what to look for. This is the direct response that Jesus provides as far as the, these two questions that the disciples ask. When will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and end of the age? But Jesus doesn't stop there, though. He continues to elaborate and shifts the conversation slightly away from the specific signs that we will see in anticipation of his return. And that's where we pick up today. Today, we are concluding our series on the signs of the end, and we're going to be taking a look at what Jesus had to say as he shifts gears a bit and not really providing any more signs, but he tells us how we are to respond to these signs that Jesus has provided for us. So starting in Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, Jesus says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and put puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. And so Jesus uh, starts here talking about a fig tree. Fig trees are deciduous trees, meaning they lose their leaves in the winter, they're seasonal trees. And part of that process as they lie dormant during the winter seasons, their branches stiffen up as well. And so when springtime rolls around, the trees, they begin to sprout new leaves and the branches start to flex more as they have more life in, in uh, the branches. And this is a sign to uh, the Israelites, to, to the other people around, that summer is right around the corner. When you see the fig trees uh, sprouting leaves and, and you see uh, the, the branches becoming more tender, tender, you know that summer is right around the corner. Similarly, Jesus says that when you see all these signs that Jesus talked about in these first 30 verses, then you know that he is near. Jesus will come soon to earth when these signs are fulfilled. And so Jesus continues in verse 34 and he says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And so Jesus, after talking about this fig tree, and the fig tree uh, gives us signs, the summer is near, and Jesus' return is just like that with these signs. He then goes on to say something that I wish he provided a little more clarity on. And, and there are lots of statements, lots of teachings I wish Jesus was a little more clear on uh, th throughout the scriptures, and this is one of many. And Jesus says that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And now there's a number of different ways that people inter interpret this statement from Jesus that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. I'll share with you all uh, the two most common inter interpretations that I'm aware of. First, many think that Jesus is talking about the generation of people alive when he said these things. This generation, the generation of the disciples, would not pass away until all these things take place. Good evidence for this interpretation is that if someone were to talk about this generation, one would just assume they are talking about the present generation. And that's where many people come away with this idea that Jesus is talking about this current generation, the, the, the generation of the disciples. They would not pass away until all these things took place. The second uh, common interpretation is that many think that Jesus is talking about a future generation that would witness the events like the abomination of desolation and great tribulation. I think good evidence for this interpretation is that Jesus stated this condition that all these things will take place. And we see, if we look back at the life of the disciples, we look back through the books of history, we see that some of these things did indeed take place in the lives of the disciples in their generation. 
I'm not uh, convinced that all these things took place in the generation of the disciples. I'm not convinced that uh, the sign of the Son of Man appeared in heaven. I'm not convinced that the Son of Man came on the clouds with power and great glory. And so because of that, I tend to think that Jesus is referring to a future generation. A future generation would not pass away until all these things take place, like the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation, uh, the return of the Son of Man descending on the clouds clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so it seems like the, these events uh, kind of be jumbled together as this generation would not pass away until all these things took place. And Jesus uh, saying heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And we get that picture of a new heaven and a new earth that John talks about in Revelation 21 and a couple of the prophets in the Old Testament talk about as well. So Jesus continues in verse 36, and Jesus says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. It's a big statement here. But concerning that day and hour. Well, what day and what hour is Jesus referring to here? Well, he's referring to that, that time when the, the Son of Man would descend on the clouds with hev, uh, on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, as he stated in verse thirty six. So also, when you see all these things, you know that He, Jesus, is near at the very gate. So Jesus is talking about the day and the hour in which Jesus would descend on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. When Jesus would descend from heaven to earth, concerning that day and concerning that hour, no one knows. No one knows that day or the hour when Jesus would come back to earth. And so we have to be very, very careful about assigning certain dates and times to the return of Jesus. There have been many people over the past 2,000 years who have tried to assign a date and assign a time to the return of Jesus. And thus far, every single person has been wrong. They have all falsely predicted uh, the return of Jesus. And so we should, uh, we, we should be aware when people start making these bull claims that Jesus is going to come back at uh, this day, this hour, this minute, whatever the case may be, we, we should remember the words of Jesus when Jesus says, no one knows that day or hour. And not only does no uh, human know that day nor hour, but Jesus takes it a, a step further. And he says, not even the angels know when that day or hour would come. Some would maybe assume that God would share this plan with, with the heavenly host, with the angel, as far as when he would send his son back down to earth. But not even the angels know when Jesus would come back to earth. And on top of that, the son himself, Jesus himself, didn't even know when he was going to come back. Only the father knows. Only God knows. Is it possible that Jesus knows now? Currently seated at the right hand of God? Yeah, it's possible. It's plausible to think either he knows or that he doesn't know. You, you can make uh, that case either way. We, we don't have that information. But at this point, at this teaching, when, when Jesus was, was uh, teaching to his disciples, going over this long discourse, he did not know that day or hour when he would come back from heaven to earth. God, on the other hand, has all knowledge. God knows when he is going to send back his son to earth to establish his kingdom on earth. But that knowledge was not given to Jesus at the time of this teaching. And so in my eyes, Jesus must be subordinate to God. And thus, uh, th th there, there seems to be some uh, difference between Jesus and the knowledge that he has and, and who God is and the knowledge that he has as well. As Jesus didn't know, but the Father clearly knew and he clearly understood when that day and when that hour would come when he would send his son back to the earth. And so Jesus continues uh, along the, the, the same line of thought. And he says in verse 37, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. And so Jesus compares uh, the second coming, the coming of the Son of Man, to the days of Noah. If we were to go back to Genesis 6 and 7 and read about this account of Noah and the ark, we get this uh, 
depiction of Noah and his family building the ark without any help from the people around them. We don't get any clear details uh, from Genesis about what was going in the minds of the other folks when Noah and his family were building the ark, but evidently they did not want to take part in this work of building this giant boat. Well, according to Jesus, we see in Matthew 24, Jesus says that they were unaware that the flood was coming. And and so Noah and their family building this big giant boat in anticipation that God gave them clear instruction to build this boat. He gave all the dimensions and he's going to bring the animals on the boat with them. Why? Because there was going to be a great flood coming. God gave that information to Noah, but evidently, according uh, to the words of Jesus here in, in Matthew 24, They were unaware that the flood was about to come, all these other people around Noah. And so what were the people around Noah doing right before uh, this this massive flood came? Well, Jesus says that they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying one another. They were going on with life as they knew it. And uh, that, that's kind of uh, the picture. I like uh, the movie Evan Almighty. Has anybody seen the movie Evan Almighty? That's a, a very uh, loose modern day interpretation of, yeah, emphasis on loose, uh, interpretation of Noah and the Ark. In the movie uh, Evan Almighty, family friend, friendly movie, Evan uh, is instructed from God to build the ark. And while Evan builds the ark, everyone else thinks this man is crazy. They don't want to take part in building the ark or getting in. Uh, they don't believe that the, the water, that the world is going to flood or this area is going to flood. And so they don't take part, and then the water starts to come in. And that's sort of the picture that Jesus paints as well. So people were eating, drinking, uh, getting married to one another. They're going on life as they knew it, unaware that the flood was indeed coming. And Jesus says that his coming is just like this. Just like people were unaware that the flood was going to come during the the days of Noah, Jesus says people are going to be unaware uh, about the coming of the Son of Man. And so we have to take this in stride with all of the signs that Jesus provides for us. Jesus just spent 30 verses giving us clear signs of what to expect in anticipation of his second coming, in anticipation of the end of the age. And then after going over all these signs, he, he goes over uh, the, the illustration of a fig tree. When, when a fig tree uh, produces its leaves and its uh, branches become tender, you know that summer is near. So Jesus is indicating that when you see these signs, you know that he is near. And then he, he, he flips the other side of the coin. And he says that day is going to be just like the time of Noah. People are going to be unaware of when this day is going to come. And so Jesus continues in verse 40. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this. That if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is a passage that, that some come away with the idea uh, of the rapture where uh, two people working out in the field and all of a sudden uh, one person is missing. Two ladies are working all of a sudden uh, one lady is missing. First Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 verses 13 through 18 depict the children of God meeting Jesus in the clouds as Jesus descends from heaven to earth. It doesn't seem to me uh, that that reunion will take very long, meeting Jesus in the clouds. I don't think we'll miss out on much uh, going down on earth. Kind of a different picture uh, that people get when they think of the rapture, a a teaching that was really popular come the 70s. Uh, But but here uh, we we get this idea that the the children of God, they they do meet Jesus in the air. But it doesn't seem like we're we're missing out on much. A rather brief reunion in the clouds before we descend to the earth. Uh, But Jesus compares his coming, uh, this reunion uh, with Jesus, to a thief this time around. And when we think about a thief, a thief comes in the middle of the night at an unexpected time. 
If we knew when a thief was going to come, we would stay, uh, we would stay awake all night and we would uh, prepare our house ready for a thief to come in. But that's the whole idea of why people get robbed over and over and over again is because they come at unexpected times. We don't know when they are going to come. And Jesus says that his coming will be compared to a thief breaking in at night as well. And so what are we to do with this information? He says, therefore... You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And so Jesus continues uh, this last passage here in this whole series. Verse 45, Jesus says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master has set over his household, to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, He will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So finally, we have this last picture, this last image that Jesus uh, uses in reference to his return. And we have this image of a master uh, setting his possessions in control to uh, different servants. And we see that the master leaves. And when the master returns with the servants who are faithful in the dealings of this master's possessions, the master rewards them. As far as the servants who who are not faithful with with the master's possessions, they're they're out getting drunk, not not caring what in the world they are doing, we see that the master is going to punish these servants. And I think uh, the the object lesson there is quite obvious with the return of Jesus, Jesus being that master. When he comes back, those who are faithful will be rewarded in the end. Those who are not deemed faithful, those who who are, are wicked, beating their fellow servants and drinking with drunkards. Um, th- that day will come and that person, that servant will be punished. They'll be thrown in that place where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so we have to be careful of how we conduct ourselves as our master is coming back. And he will reward his faithful servants and he will punish the wicked. And so this is all in response. This whole chapter, it's a rather lengthy chapter, 51 verses, all in response to two questions the disciples asked Jesus. When will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and end of the age? And overall, Jesus gives us a number of signs to be on the lookout for in anticipation of his return. And some of these signs are quite specific. Quite specific that there's going to be a great tribulation unlike anything the world has seen. Quite specific that, there, that the sun is going to be dark and the moon will not give us light, that the stars will fall from the sky. And so Jesus gives us all these signs to be on the lookout for his coming and end of the age. And I think that we should not just brush these signs aside. I think these signs are given to us for a very good reason. I think we are to study up on these signs. I think it would be wise uh, of us and prudent of us to, to take a look at the world around us and, and see what sort of signs are present in the world today. And so we need to be familiar with these signs. And at the same time, we need to take these signs and clues and step with the idea that nobody knows when Jesus is going to come back to earth. It's a, it's a bit contradictory, the first half of this chapter and the last half of this chapter. We have these ideas of when Jesus is going to come back. Eh, well, actually, Jesus says nobody knows when he is going to come back. And so because of that, we need to be ready at all times. At all times. When our master comes back, Jesus comes back, and we find ourselves faithful to our master, we will be rewarded. We will meet with him in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. We'll be granted eternal life. If we are found at his return when we do not expect it, and we are not faithfully serving our master, it's at that time that the wicked servants would be punished and thrown in the place of the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so be aware of the signs. More importantly, be ready 
at all times. For Jesus is coming back and he will defeat every last enemy. The enemy of sin and death will be defeated once and for all. There will be no more mourning. There'll be no more crying or pain or sickness. God is going to make everything new. God's creation will be restored to perfection. And we have to be ready for that. Ready to have that reunion with God himself. Revelation 21.3, God himself will be with his people. Revelation 22 talks about we will see God's face. We will see our loved ones who remain faithful to God. And so we can get excited in anticipation of these signs of the end. Jesus has given us them for a reason. We don't know when that day is coming, but I am certain that today we are one day closer than we were yesterday. I'm ready for that return of Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for the grand plan that you have set before each and every one of us. Your plan from the beginning to redeem mankind, your plan from the beginning to reconcile us to yourself, your plan to defeat every last enemy, including the enemy of sin and death. So Father, I thank you for the signs that you've given us through your son, signs that we can get excited about your son's return, signs that we can get excited about the establishment of your kingdom here on earth. Father, I just pray that you help us as a church, as a body of believers, be ready for your son's return. Father, we ask that that day may come soon. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.